So I will talk in a moment about the presentation tonight by Dr. Kira Patel entitled Post-Green Revolution Agrarian Change and the Burden of Malnutrition in South Asia. But just to remind people, and if we have some newcomers, this lecture tonight is a part of a series that's a part of a coordinated event that is sponsored by Menno Simons College. We offer programs in international development and conflict resolution studies. We have had six, five presentations. This is our sixth presentation, starting back in September of 2013. These presentations have been funded largely by the Esau endowment that was started by Paul and Esther Esau back in the 1980s. And the public lectures are kind of a key part of it. There are courses that we're running that are connected to the public lectures, and there's a, a website, and we have a social media engagement process. And you can go to our website if you want to learn more about that. The event so far, Dr. Martin Enns talked about changing agriculture to sustain the world, a sequel. Dr. Shirley Thompson spoke about harvest of hope and food sovereignty in northern Manitoba. Dr. Ha uh, Haroon Akram Lodi spoke about feeding the world is hunger inevitable. Then in January, Dr. Nettie Weeb spoke about this land is our land reintegrating earth eating and ethics. Then in February, we had Dr. Eric Holt Jimenez speak on food rebellions, crisis, and the hunger for justice. And at Kirit's um, suggestion, if there's time at the very end of our evening, I'd like to take a few minutes to try and do a little bit of synthesis of what we've learned, or what I should say what I've learned in this uh, series. And I hope you're doing the same thing, but I will try and share a bit at the end. So this is our wrap-up session. And so why have we done this? Why has Menno Simons College sponsored this event? Well, we sponsored it because we think that food and farming are integral integrally important to our world. And yet, they seem to be placed in terms of sort of a hierarchy of importance at a relatively low level. Often, we, we don't seem to hear about our farming system or our food system unless there's big problems. So, we think it's important to, to look at it and to critically unpack it. And there's basic issues like the poorest billion people in the world are either farmers or very close to farming, many of them that is. And the environmental challenges that we're facing globally, many of them are connected to farming and how farmland is being treated. So there's huge current topical issues connected to the food system and the farming system, and there's a lot of controversy. And so what we've tried to do in the course of this series and, and also through the related courses is we've tried to unpack, analyze, and investigate issues to do with the problems in the food system, the challenges in the farming system. And so some of those things we could label as, you know, sort of globalization versus localization. So we've looked at that quite a bit in this series the issue of addressing problems through new high technologies as compared to seeing social change as the way to address them. And then finally, the, the issue of that's sometimes presented as economic efficiency as compared to environmental sustainability. So we have tried in the process of this lecture series to unpack some of these things. And I hope that, uh, for, those that, that for those of you that have come to one or more of these events that you've learned more about these issues, which are both very important and, I think, very complex. So let me now move to introducing the um, topic and the speaker for tonight. So Dr. Patel will be looking at um, post-green revolution agrarian change, and he'll be explaining these various pieces, but in a nutshell, many people thought the Green Revolution of the 60s through the 70s was going to be, in a sense, a kind of magic bullet to solve the, the farming and food insecurity issues in the developing world. And indeed, it did solve some problems. So for instance, in many developing countries that have experienced the Green Revolution, particularly in Asia, there has been an improvement in yields. There has been a growth in agricultural production. And yet, other problems have resisted resolution through the Green Revolution. And so issues like inequality, poverty, 
These are issues that are faced in many Asian countries and certainly in South Asia. And Dr. Patel will be looking at India and we know in other countries like Bangladesh and Nepal, similar kinds of challenges exist. Moreover, environmental challenges have resulted from the Green Revolution. So a loss in agricultural biodiversity has been a um, consequence of the Green Revolution. And there's other complicating issues. For instance, malnutrition is more common in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, even though South Asia has really been a center point of, of the Green Revolution. So it seems to be a contradiction that on the one hand, the Green Revolution has succeeded in many ways, and yet on the other hand, many of the problems that were to be solved by the Green Revolution persist. Another important issue is uh, public policy and food distribution policy and how that's risen in various Asian and South Asian countries to address food insecurity, and Dr. Patel will be talking about that. And again, the goal in some cases has been to reduce food insecurity, but I think what we'll see is that the consequence has been more complicated. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Kirit Patel. He's been an assistant professor at Menno Simons College for seven years. He is a very um, busy and engaged researcher, and he is the lead principal investigator in, well, it's a really big project. It's a $3.4 million project that is funded by uh, the um, International Development Research Center, and he is a part of a very large team of researchers, including academics and practitioners in Canada and in South Asia, and they are looking at a number of facets of this question of post-green revolution agrarian change, focusing on the issue of, of, uh, of millets and, and what happened to, to millets. And it's a fascinating research project, a very important research project. And the photo there is of the Governor General who recently visited their research project in, uh, I think it was in Bangalore. So hopefully we'll hear a little bit more about that. Dr. Patel has uh, published numerous articles on food security, environmental justice, farmers' rights, and sustainable development. And he teaches many courses for us in international development studies and environmental sustainability. So uh, I would now like to introduce and, and please um, welcome Dr. Kirit Patel. Thank you, Dr. Jerry Buckland, Dean of the Men of Simons College. My colleagues at the Men of Simons College and at the CMU and colleagues who are serving on the committee for this lecture for providing me an opportunity to share my work with, uh, t with the colleagues here and the students here tonight in a very prestigious uh, ser lecture series. And as Jerry described, uh, all the speakers so far were very distinguished scholar and whose work I myself have benefited a lot and, and read a lot and admire them a lot. So I'm happy to be in a club of those speakers today, maybe a wrong person in a paradise, but uh, neither I'm a distinguished scholar nor a visiting uh, lecturer here, but tonight probably I'll keep that label for a while. So thank you so much uh, for giving this opportunity. Thank you all the students uh, for coming here. That makes me uh, feel I mean, a more comfortable and less nervous with this title of uh, ESA visiting or distinguished speaker. So thank you for coming here. And uh, I also thank uh, Derek Johnson, Darshi, and Manish, who will be with me on the panel. And we'll take this learning, learning journey through after my talk. So thank you so much to everyone. Tonight, uh, I think Jerry has so done the job in three minutes. He already told whatever I was going to say, and my lecture is probably a kind of a redundant now. So anyway, well, I will tell some jokes and story. Probably the students know. So we'll, yeah, remind me if, if I'm a bit too much technical and 
you feel boring, then we'll look at the jokes. So the technical message already has been delivered by Jerry, and I'll just uh, underline some of those uh, thoughts throughout my lecture. Uh, as I said, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about the stories, and probably let's talk about the joke. Uh, I knew today that uh, on the panel, at least, there will be a couple of people from South Asia. And in the audience also, I expected some from South Asia. And the popular joke is that if two South Asian walking on a sidewalk, and if they are talking pleasantly, that, and if you have to guess the topic of their conversation, you can easily imagine that they must be talking about some recent Bollywood movie. I mean, uh, that's a happy conversation you can see. If you hear that they are raising some, uh, their voice uh, after a while, while they are walking, then you can easily guess that the topic of conversation has changed probably from a Bollywood movie to cricket. And uh, if they roll up their sleeves, then you can easily imagine that they are talking about politics and most likely from Delhi. So I wouldn't dare today uh, to talk either about the cricket or politics, uh, because I know that my colleagues are from the region. And uh, so probably it would be a safest if I talk about the Olympic. And uh, I wouldn't compare India's performance uh, with South Asian neighbors. So I mean, the chances of uh, raising voice or rolling up our sleep would not be there. So what you see here on the map, uh, it is a performance of uh, India and other countries in the BRICS. It is a club uh, composed of Brazil, Russia, India, South Africa, and China. And India, I mean, very proudly a member of that club. So I thought it would not be unfair to compare India's performance in, in the Olympics over last maybe 20 years or so, and uh, take a look at it, how India is doing. If you look at the map, I mean, obviously, I would imagine, or anyone would imagine, that India would be at the bottom. So the bottom green line is the India's uh, total, I mean, it's a performance over time from 1992 to 2012, the number of true medals uh, it won in the Olympic. If you see it, by the end of the 2012, it has catch up with uh, with the South Africa. So some might take a little bit, I mean, the Indian might take a proud that at least we are moving ahead. We are not at the rock, bo at the rock bottom. But may, wait a minute. I mean, it's unfair if we compare without taking a consideration of a population. As we know that we do not compare Canada with uh, Americans. Only we compete for the hockey medal. The rest of the medals, we just count one-tenth of the US. So same way for probably India, too. So take a look at the, I mean, the, in, uh, in, with reference to the population, the number of total gold medal won over last 20 years, and uh, for a million people in those five countries. And India has a 0 0.01 gold medal per million people. Uh, South Africa is nowhere close. I mean, the second lowest you see here is China. So nowhere, I mean, the India is 0 0.01, and I, <clears throat> it's very difficult to make up there, that pl I mean, even with China. So uh, the question is that why this performance is so poor? I was reflecting this, that why the country which has done so well in many respects, in economics, uh, in politics, and in every respect it has done so well in the last 50 years, why its performance in the Olympic is so, still so poor? So tonight, uh, through my number of slides, I would try to answer uh, part of this question indirectly, may not be directly, and, uh, but we will see, or probably at the end of the lecture, you would see why the performance is so. And uh, if Indians are expecting to do better shortly, probably they are uh, doing a daydreaming or something. So let's take a look at the... <coughs> Tonight I will talk about the Green Revolution. As I said, Jerry already gave a, a kind of a context of a Green Revolution. What I would do is that the, I would analyze the impact of Green Revolution from the perspective of India. I would analyze uh, some of the agrarian change which has occurred in the last 40 years or so after implementation of the intensive Green Revolution. 
And the purpose there for analysis is not to criticize green revolution. I mean, a lot of scholars have done that, and so I don't want to repeat it. The purpose is to understand that how we can address the issue of food security. So I would analyze the situation or the change which has occurred in the agrarian landscape in the last 40 years or so. And what is the impact of that change in terms of the impact on the nutrition, impact on the health? So the, uh, in the process, I will highlight the features of food and nutrition insecurity in India. As you can imagine, India is a different, I mean, when you put anything on the global map or compare the different countries, India is always an outlier. I mean, it's a, either on one ex this side of the extreme or another extreme. It never follows the trend, as you saw in, in case of Olympic two, right? So the, uh, yeah, I will try to explain the features of food insecurity. And that is a topic, something we have also explored through all six uh, different, I mean, uh, uh, five different uh, uh, lectures in the past. Then towards the end, uh, I would uh, share some, uh, some of the information from the intervention we made uh, through a research project which Jerry briefly mentioned. And uh, through that, I mean the intervention, I would highlight that how probably we can address some of those issues. So <clears throat> my talk would be roughly around 50 minutes and uh, I have a, a lot of slides but I would take, I mean I'll quickly go through those slides. Some of those slides are just simply showing the, the trends and some of the slides I would probably spend more time. And the, in the beginning I would probably spend a little bit more time Later on, I will just, uh, I mean, uh, show the, some of the slides which will give you, the, uh, I mean, a more, an overview of my project. I also uh, would like to acknowledge the support and, and the work uh, my colleagues have done. By no means, uh, I mean, the work which I would be presenting from my project is done by myself alone. I mean, most of the work which I would be presenting, those, that work I'm sharing from my colleagues in the project, a number of students uh, from four different Canadian universities who are working with my project. I mean, their excellent work has uh, contributed a lot to my presentation. The, in terms of a Green Revolution, uh, as I said, a lot has been done. Simply, the Green Revolution is a kind of intensive effort to promote high yielding varieties which were developed through a scientific research. And those uh, varieties were promoted by different development actors, including the governments or the states uh, internationally as well as locally in the developing countries. Those varieties were pushed in, in, in the agriculture sector in order to increase the yield. In the process of promoting those high yielding varieties or high performing varieties, uh, those varieties were supported or they needed a, a microenvironment in the form of a, a, for a chemical fertilizer, pesticide, and irrigation. And those inputs were organized by the state uh, through a different type of, a I mean, the policies and programs. So the, the Green Revolution is one of the most significant intervention, I would say, in the, de in the developing sector in the last 40 years which were aimed at increasing the food production or addressing the issue of a food uh, insecurity in the global south. So as you can imagine, I mean, the production had increased, especially the two crops, which you see here on the map. The productivity of the rice, which is the top uh, line, and the productivity of the wheat, which is a green line. The productivity of the rice, which has almost increased uh, uh, 3.5 times while the productivity of the wheat increased by 2.5 times. So in the last uh, 40 years, uh, after, I mean, since the 1960s, if you see at the bottom, I mean, in the 1950s and 1960s, more or less the productivity of the rice and wheat uh, was the same. What you see here, the, I mean, you know, the bar, they, are, they represent the area allocated to these crops in India. So over time, through this, uh, this intensive efforts of under the Green Revolution, the area under rice and wheat increased, and so the yield also increased, and the productivity. Productivity means the yield per, per unit area. So it, it, uh, from the outset, I mean, at the outset, it looks that it has a remarkable, remarkable impact. But as you know, in the social sciences, and for most of my social sci I mean, uh, science colleagues, and the students, I mean, uh, at least uh, in, in, at present time, 
they see green revolution very critically. For them, the green revolution is a kind of a Faustian bargain. It has nothing much to offer. And there, as I said, I mean, there are lots of critique has been done uh, for the green revolution. So in, this, uh, the, in the social sciences, the green revolution is seen as a kind of a, uh, I mean, um, if not evil, but something an endeavor which has a very little to offer to the small farmers or farmers in the South. And, and as you remember, I mean, out of five ESO lecture, uh, speakers, uh, four speakers, I mean, very rightly, they highlighted those negative impacts. And many of those impacts or the, those negative impacts, I do agree. And, uh, and I, I mean, I see those impacts also in, in South Asia and many other parts of the world. But the, as I said, the, India, the case of India is a slightly different. And uh, without looking at the historical and the political context of a green revolution, often we undermine the impact of a green revolution. So I, I mean, um, I would like to uh, give a little bit of context in which the green revolution was introduced or launched uh, in, the, in South Asia. And what was the impact? And here I wouldn't use the, I mean, the critiques or the research and analysis of scientists, but probably I would rely more on what the political leadership and the other actors believed about the Green Revolution. Before I, I, I mean, uh, analyze the, uh, the Green Revolution or give my two minutes take on the Green Revolution, I would like to take you to the, I mean, the, to the history. If you remember 1947, India became independent. And if you look at the any book by written by any scholar of that era from 1947 to 1946, they, I mean, invariably, they highlight that the, the country has a no future. A very nice, a very excellent, I mean, a scholarly book by uh, Ram Chandra Guha, a contemporary historian. He examined the history after the, I mean, uh, independence of India. And he says that the uh, installation of democracy in India was the biggest gamble of the last century. And, and that is a correct, I mean, uh, uh, or the description, because nowhere in the history the democracy was installed or adopted in a developing country with a high illiteracy. There was no geographic identity of a nation in the region. The population was divided on the basis of religion, caste, and the culture. So um, the Guha writes that all these scholars, I mean, of, uh, of that time, they, their, their heart liked India to become succe uh, too successful, but their mind wasn't agreeing with it. Looking at any factor, there was no way it was, I mean, uh, it would become a kind of a successful nation state. So they, it was a challenging time. The ecological historian, they often argue, not to undermine the Mahatma Gandhi's, I mean, the independence movement, they argue that the India would have become independent anyway, even without the, I mean, the Gandhi's movement. The reason they are saying that the way the, the colonial power or the colonial rulers, they exploited the natural resources uh, uh, in, in, during their time. The natural resources degraded so much that the colony was no more economically successful enterprise. And they were also feeling kind of accountable or responsible for feeding the huge population in, in South Asia. So they, they argue that no matter what happened politically, probably they would have vacated the colony. So again, I don't want to, or they do, want, do not want to undermine the, I mean, the, the contribution of the independence movement. The issue is that the India was facing a serious challenge of a food security. Natural resources were degraded. The productivity was so low. The agriculture was so, uh, I mean, uh, fragmented, and the farmers were so small, there was no hope of feeding, I mean, ever-growing population in that part of the world. So in that context, in the 1960s, the agriculture scientist, along with the help of some of the scientists from the International Agriculture Research Institution called CG Institution, they, they tried to work, uh, work with the idea, which is now, I mean, became known as a Green Revolution, that the improving the performance of a local, uh, lo I mean, the varieties, and promoting those seeds to the farmers. So the Green Revolution was, per was perceived 
in a different context in India. So in 1963, that was the first year Dr. M. S. Swaminathan remembers receiving the seeds from Mexico, I mean the father of the Green Revolution in South Asia. And, and uh, he, he received the seeds in 1963. His team worked very intensively with the other scientists. By the year 1967, the productivity of wheat became double in the period of four years without increasing the area. That has to be underlined. The, the food production increased without increasing, without cutting the forest and bringing it into the agriculture. So the impact was so high. And in a country like India, I mean, uh, uh, pro uh, solving a problem in a shorter period is uh, not an easy task. So in the 1968, the, the Prime Minister of India, Mrs. Indira Gandhi was the Prime Minister at that time, she came to address the convocation function of a small agriculture college uh, in the country, and she was a prime minister of a large country. It was not like a prime minister of a country like Costa Rica, where there you have a smaller population and no army, and probably you can see a prime minister twice in a week. Uh, actually, I saw twi uh, twice in a week in a conference, uh, in a small conference uh, in Costa Rica. But while getting a prime minister in India for a small convocation of a college, it's a very significant matter. So that's what the, I mean, what I'm highlighting here, that the attention of the prime minister, even to this kind of event, was so much uh, significant. So she, she addressed the agriculture scientists, and she, she acknowledged their contribution. And following the year, she released a postal stamp. What you see here, the bar chart shows the productivity, or uh, sorry, the production of, uh, I mean, the wheat, and how it has increased from 1951 to 1968. So what I'm trying to show here is that the impact for or impact of a green revolution for the political leadership in the country was totally different. The context was different. And in that context, the green revolution was perceived. The, <clears throat> after, after 50 years now, uh, of the Indian independence. Now I would take you after 30 years what happened and how the same leadership saw the Green Revolution. So I was, uh, I was in India, uh, uh, I mean, until 1999. I left India in the year 2000, and it was the Golden Jubilee year of Indian Republic. So the, uh, India became a republic in 1950 with its own constitution and removed the monarch, I mean, the head of the state. So it was the 50th year of, uh, I mean, anniversary uh, in the year 2000. The president of India, uh, of, I mean, the president of India, Dr. Uh, Mr. K. R. Narayanan, he was, a, I mean, he came from a lower caste. He was a, pol I mean, he was a political scholar. He was not a agriculture scientist or, or a, uh, I mean, a, a development practitioner. In his address to the nation on this occasion. He said that the India achieved two things in the last 50 years. The first, he said that India remained democratic. And if you remember what I said, that all the speculation in the, in the 1947 until 1960, even Ramchandra Guha says that even, even the 70s, all the time, when the prime minister, I mean, the died uh, in case of India, I mean, in the early time, all the prime minister probably were changed after their death. So the, all the time when the prime minister changed, there was a speculation that this is, the, this is it. It will be taken over by the dictator. If you, the, the president was saying that the all surrounding nations in the year 2000, if you look at the Nepal, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, all the neighbors of South Asian, they, uh, South Asian neighbor, they have a checkered history of a democracy. They were also inspired for, for a democratic state, but none of them can retain or could retain the democracy. So as a political scientist or a political scholar, I appreciate, I mean, his observation. He said that India retained the democracy only for the, I mean, except the brief uh, period of uh, two years between 1975 to 77 when there was an emergency. So it was a great feat. I mean, it was a cope for India. The second, he said that India became a self-reliant in a food production over time. And he makes a beautiful connection between these two that without the second achievement, India would not have re I mean, achieved the first uh, achievement of be remaining a democracy. So that shows the importance of a green revolution from a different perspective. So I do agree with a lot of critiques and probably my, some of this, uh, I mean, the following slides would show the critiques or the, uh, the, or the, I mean, the negative impact of the environment or ne negative impact of the Green Revolution on the environment, health, soil, and the other aspect. But I, I do appreciate in the, in the context where, I mean, these efforts were made. 
and the labor the agriculture scientists did, and the, all the actors involved in the, in the Green Revolution. So I thought that maybe a little bit a different perspective on the Green Revolution compared to whatever we had so far. What you see here in a couple of my slides, what have changed after the introduction of a, I mean, the Green Revolution. If I had been a historian, probably I would, I mean, uh, analyze the trends in India from the two time, I mean, a point of time. One is in the mid 60s when, I mean, a significant change happened in terms of economy, in terms of political leadership, and in terms of even the way agriculture was done. And the second change, I see it in early 90s when the economy was liberalized, and again, it was a point or a time when a lot of things have changed. And I guess the, the another point of time is coming is year 2014, but we have to, 14, we have to see. So the well, lots of slides which you see over time, my analysis is either around 1970s time period or in nine, early 1990. So the, what you see here, that the, because of a green revolution, and I, as I say, that these varieties, those crops, or the improved varieties, they needed a high, a high amount of, uh, of fertilizer, they needed pesticide, and they needed uh, ir uh, irrigation too. So in the process of promoting green revolution and increasing the production, what happened that the chemical fertilizers were used intensively. The state established chemical fertilizer companies. The, the, I mean, in the last 30 to 40 years, uh, in the beginning, most of the fertilizers companies were also owned by the state, not by the multinational companies or the, the private sector. The use of nitrogen was so excessive. What you see here, that the nitrogen was used uh, 10 times more than the phosphorus and that, uh, uh, sorry, the more, uh, 10 times more than the, uh, the potash and probably three times more than the phosphorus. What it signifies that the poor plant and for our body, we need a 16 different, I mean, the micronutrients or elements. Out of 16, through the chemical fertilizer, we were only supplying only three. And out of three, only one, the nitrogen was excessively used, highly subsidized chemical fertilizer. So what happened that it became a, like a perform, uh, I mean the drug, which enhances your performance for a while. So the soil did produce for a while, I mean, or, or the farmers did produce for a while, excellent yield, but the soil became highly degraded. What you see here at the bottom, the maps, uh, it is a soil, I mean the deficiency of a iron and a zinc in a soil in the province of Tamil Nadu, where I work uh, along with my other uh, colleagues in my research projects. So the soil became uh, deficient in the, in the micronutrient. Second important change after 1960s over time, again, these changes have not over occurred overnight. What you see here that the land holding has declined very significantly. The, in the year 2011, the latest survey, the average holding, every, this is the average land holding, that is 2.9 acre per farmer. And uh, out of these, the, I mean, uh, one third, oh, sorry, two thirds of the farmers have actually less than a one acre, a one acre of the land. So they are, they are very small farmers. Many of those farmers are net buyers of food, not the self-reliant, I mean, the producer, which you normally assume as a small farmers in, in the developing country. So a lot of food they, they consume, um, uh, a part of that food, they, they buy it from the market. And the 50% of the rural population actually is a landless and dependent on agriculture. So there's a huge proportion of a rural population. Either they have a small piece of a land or they are landless and dependent on a small scale agriculture. I mean, either they work on, uh, on the somebody's farm or some industry or some other, I mean, the enterprise which is directly dependent on, on the agriculture. The, in the next slide, this is a slide uh, which I prepared during my doctoral research in a village where I, I lived for two years. And uh, uh, this is a geographically correct map of an uh, agricultural landscape of a village in, a, in a Gujarat. So it is a tribal village. You might see the, some, the large blocks on the co right corner uh, at the bottom. And what I did, that in, I took a map from the village uh, office, village, uh, I mean the secretary office, and this map was prepared during the British time in 1920. And British were fair in the sense of a, uh, their taxing system was fair. 
the agricultural land was mapped first time in the history in India during the British regime. And they, they, they put the tax on the farmers, but they, they had a fair system that the tax would be according to the, I mean, your size of the land. So they mapped the land. So I took the map, and I could not find that map was matching anywhere on the landscape. So the, what you see, the small, small pieces, that's the real, the real farm today. What you see on the, on the other side, the large blocks, that was the original size of the farm in 1920. So that one acre piece of a land is divided probably four or six places in a small village. I, see, I saw many plots or I mean the farms which were smaller than actually this classroom. I, uh, probably even a half of this, this cla classroom and they planted three different types of rice varieties. So the land was divided 12 times. So each plot would, I mean on average, divided 12 times uh, from 1920 to 2002. And the farmers were less than a one acre of land were 65% farmers. More or less matches with the national average. So the land has been divided, fragmented, the land holding is small, and the soil has become degraded. Again, I mean, it's not necessarily it is a directly impact of a green revolution, but the green revolution was one of the major factors too, and there were many other social, political, and cultural changes uh, occurred over time too. The next slide shows that what farmers are eating. And in this, the pie chart, what you see, that is based, I mean, again, uh, based on a very robust survey uh, called an NSSO survey from the government, which is done throughout the country or every five or six years uh, repeated. Well, the data which I have used is 1994. And uh, in the plate you see is the more than, I mean, probably a, almost a 90% what they are eating is rice. So whatever their calorie comes from the rice. The rest of the cereals you see in a small part, that includes the wheat, uh, millets, and uh, some pulses. Uh, no, sorry, no pulses. Uh, wheat, sorghum, pearl millet, finger millet, that, comp I mean, all together even less than 10%, or around 10%. So what happened that because of a green revolution, rice was I mean, produced in a greater quantity. What the state thought, I mean, the state job was that let's I mean, redistribute this rice. So they provided the market, I mean, the support prices and redistributed the rice at a subsidized price to the people so the people can have access to the food. So the rice was promoted through the government distribution system, either a free or a very nominal price. So the, so the, uh, the food consumption, uh, which, I mean, uh, historically farmers or the people consumed very diverse, uh, or their food basket was very diverse. Now it is replaced by a one grain while the, the diversity of the food, food basket declined. The second most important change also occurred and, and not still understood by the scholars, or scholars are still struggling to understand, is the rural urban migration. So far, our surveys, I mean, the government survey never included earlier the factor of the migration. Now, recently, they started, I mean, taking, or they are taking this data, but it is such a complex process. And uh, still, the scholars are struggling. The NGOs and developments, uh, I mean, uh, institutions are, I mean, um, for a long time, they were denying the migration is happening because their job was to promote the agrarian change. So the, anyway, we'll come a little bit more later on, uh, I mean, the implication of that, uh, the change. But the migration is occurring the, in the last 10 years. This is, I mean, uh, the, nine, uh, the, the India in the year 2011 has a nine million less farmer than what it recorded in the year 2001. So the nine million farmers probably they sold their land or it exchanged the hands or may have given it to relatives and they moved to the cities. What happened to the impact of this? I mean, the, pro, the degradation of the soil, the change in the, uh, change in the food consumption pattern, migration from rural to urban areas, all these change contributed to the health. And uh, the where data on the anemia was taken for a long time because anemia was something which was, uh, I mean, uh, was uh, understood or was, uh, I mean, probably realized that it is a problem in a developing country for a long time. So all over you see that there is a high proportion uh, or high prevalence of anemia in, in the rural uh, uh, India as well as the urban India. I have a next couple of some slides I will take you through quite quickly because those are the trends and, and later on I will spend a little bit more time on what we can do. This is a slide, again, I mean, it reminds me the, uh, the another historical point in the Indian post-independence hi history. 
In the year 2012, one small NGO called uh, Nandi, they, uh, they, uh, they published a report called Hangama Report. And what you see here in, in the slide, I mean, there are, there are data, well, the, it is a data on the stunted and the underweight. And they are compared from year 2005 to 2011. And almost half of the children were either under, uh, were underweight or stunted. Such a huge proportion of a population which was malnourished. And that captured the eyes of political leadership only recently. And the data were worse than sub-Saharan Africa. And data were so robust, it was not like a taking a data from a one village. I remember the year 2012, just a year, year ago, again on the Republic Day, I mean the same podium where the president spoke very, uh, at the occasion of a golden jubilee in the, year 2000, uh, in the year 2000, very proudly about the food grain production. At the same podium, the prime minister, current prime minister of India, he, he, he referred to this report by name, that the Hangama reports data, he said that it is a national shame and the other side of the economic growth. So the, the, again, the India is facing a different type of a problem. It is a shame that the, I mean, the, the economic growth is, a, I mean, it compares with the other BRIC nations while the health and nutrition is nowhere close to even a sub-Saharan African countries. The, again, I mean, uh, the country, I mean, uh, as it happens classically, I mean, the leadership would deny or the scholars would deny. The be so there was a denial, but as I said, uh, their sample were, was so robust, so there was difficult to deny. Um, I will come now to a couple of slides where, where I mean, my colleagues and I work uh, in, in this research project funded by IDRC and CEDA, and we looked at uh, the, the health, some of the indicators on the, uh, at the public health level at the village level, because in case of India, the national uh, average is, uh, I mean, most likely misleading. You can't compare, I mean, the or use the national average for doing anything at a local level, because India always had the two extreme. You see the Kerala at one extreme, and the other side, are there are a number of provinces where they are, I mean, worse than the sub-Saharan Africa. So the national average is not a good indicator for making any intervention. So we, we started with a baseline survey and a couple of slides I have on the health indicators in those regions uh, uh, where we, we work. I, I forgot to mention at the beginning there was a map of India and it, it showed eight different spots uh, in India, uh, six different spots in India and two spots, one in Sri Lanka and and one in Nepal. So our research project is focused on those eight sites, and my data are collected from those eight, eight sites, but I'm referring more only to the Indian data here in these slides. What you see here, the, <clears throat> what we were trying to do is that the, the mal, uh, malnutrition, how it is explained by economic class, how it is explained by caste, and how it is explained by gender. Very, very disturbing. You look at, in this, there are four project sites which I have put here. In fact, based on the basis of a land uh, holding, uh, what you see on the right, the medium-sized farmers, small farmers, and the landless farmer. Within their, far, within their families, what is the, I mean, the state of a health? And actually, the, the farmers who had a lot, I mean, a re, I mean, relatively more land, their indicator on health was not better either. The, in fact, the landless probably in some cases had even a better, better health indicator compared to the, I mean, the, the more relatively uh, larger farmer. So the, uh, the, cla uh, the classical, I mean, the uh, theories or explanation on the basis of a class does not explain the malnutrition. Second, look at, again, the data on the basis of a caste as it comes to the, I mean, your mind in case of India, that the lower caste would always, I mean, often we say the caste is a, uh, I mean, a manifestation of a class, and the, uh, the lower caste is a lower class. But again, if you look at the caste, the caste also does not explain the distribution of mal uh, malnutrition either. The higher caste uh, children from the higher caste family also had a, had a poor health. And in, in fact, in the, some cases, even the lower caste fam, I mean, families with the blue color had a lower proportion or prevalence of a or wasting or a lower BMI, I mean, the kids with a uh, lower BMI, BMI. So the caste does not explain either. Look at the gender, very interesting. 
uh, if you look at the gender below the three years uh, age, the, uh, the girls in the, the girls have, a, uh, I guess, the red color. And the first site, which is close to the city called Bangalore, so it is a quite, I mean, the, the, this site is quite connected with the city. The second site is connected with a smaller city, not a large city like a Bangalore. And the last two sites are, are remote tribal sites. If you look at the remote tribal sites, the data of the, I mean, the health of the girl uh, child below the three years age was better than the male child within the family. So the girls, were, their health was better than, than the male children. Well, if the sites were more connected with the urban growth or the economic boom, there the data was, I mean, had a kind of a positive uh, trend. But the most interesting is the next slide. When we looked at the, again, at the gender with the older kids and the adult, so the age group between the 15 to 49, the girls lost their health. So the, this shows that the, there is a problem of a distribution of a food at a household level. So the food, I mean, the household may have a food or may have a scarcity of a food, but it is not evenly distributed. Whatever the gain the girl children had at the below the three years uh, age, it completely lo I mean, got lost. So the, the implication is that the sociocultural practices uh, promoting the gender divide have, a, I mean, a probably influenced the, the distribution of uh, food and nutrition within the family. So the data, again, in case of India, very complex. The existing, I mean, socioeconomic and cultural theories are not explain, I mean, do not explain those trends uh, easily, and one need to analyze the ecological context. The ecological context means the, the, not simply the ecology, but the context around those practices in a much deeper way. The other aspect of a malnutrition, which was not considered very important and quite alarming and quite disturbing, especially in case of India, what you see here is a data on a type 2 diabetes. Probably, I mean, in a city like Winnipeg, we know the impact of a diabetes on the aboriginal uh, population or the uh, communities here. And it is highly related with the food consumption. Of course, there are a number of factors do play the role, I mean, your lifestyle and many others. But the, uh, the kind of food they consume affects a lot in terms of a type 2 diabetes. And what you see here over time, if you look at the urban, let's forget about the urban for a second because the lifestyle has changed significantly in the urban landscape. But if you look at the rural, the, the lower line uh, or in the map, the, the increase has been somewhere around the 1995. Uh, in the project, we have a student from, a, a doctor student from University of Guelph, he's a student from epidemiology department, did a fantastic research uh, in one of our site he took a uh, sample, I mean, he studied the 700 people. And um, he, he, st he tried to study the prevalence of a diabetes and change in the food consumption habit. I'm not trying to give all the details, but what I'm saying that the, the, oh, we didn't survey the, I mean, the diabetes on the basis of simply a, a survey. Because a lot of people in the population, they do not know even that they are either predisposed to diabetes or they are suffering from the diabetes. So what he did, he, I mean, did the very scientifically, went early in the morning, fasting, took the blood sample and looked at the, I mean, the diabetes prevalence. Anyway, some other time it needs a full presentation to, under, I mean, to understand his findings and, and the work. What I'm trying to say here, that the proportion of diabetes, I mean, reported is 8.7 in, in our project sites. We find it somewhere around 12%. Still, we are analyzing the data. In, in some of the neighboring towns, we, we have even come across the, the figures around 16%. The two students from Menno Simons College also, they worked with me uh, in the last summer, and, and they were working in the city. And I will probably give you more detail a little later on. But we did ask question to the, I mean, uh, the, the consumers of the street food, that do they have anyone at home who is suffering a diabetes, uh, with the diabetes type 2. What we found that around 38% of the household, not the individuals, had at least a one person who had a diabetes. So there was a huge, uh, I mean, it's a kind of an epidemic. And India is facing a non-communicable disease epidemic. And one of those epidemic is, I mean, uh, probably is the type 2 diabetes. And second is the, I mean, the, 
probably you may be reading in the newspaper East uh, that the uh, N, uh, what's called uh, antibacterial resistant strain of the TB. So the, uh, the prevalence of a diabetes has gone up more recently and it is a malnutrition. It is a, I mean, a directly affected by the kind of a food uh, they eat and the decline in the, in the diversity of a food basket. To summarize here, whatever I have done the analysis so far, that India is facing a hidden hunger. In eight sample sites, we uh, surveyed around 2,000 households. None of the household in South Asia uh, mentioned that they were starving or they, they missed any uh, what's called square meal. None of them were facing the situation of a hunger and the starvation stories which you might have read here in the newspaper in 70s and 80s. But it is a hidden hunger, and it is a different type of a hunger. There, there are no riots in India. There are no food riots. I mean, you might have heard from, uh, uh, from the previous presenters uh, in the other parts of the world when the prices went up, there were food riots in uh, some parts of the Africa and other parts of the world. So in, in India had not faced any food riots. I mean, that's, thank God, it's a good part of it. But in my view, India is not expecting any Olympic medals either. I mean, if you look at the, the, uh, the, uh, the health of the, I mean, the current generation especially the, the health of women. I mean, no way you can expect a generation which, I mean, a next generation which would be the healthier. The other side, the food, uh, food subsidy has in last 20 years increased by 25 times. The impact on malnutrition is almost a nil. It has a significant impact on starvation and hunger, but on, not on the malnutrition. In fact, it has aggravated the malnutrition the kind of impact which I was talking about, the diabetes and other factors. The, the, well, the state and the private sector always loves the cheap food, uh, cheaper production of the food. And the uh, higher the subsidy, it, it legitimizes the interests of a state and the private sector in industrial production of a food with something we need to, I mean, uh, take into account. And probably I'll, my, now a couple of other slides will show that how we can make intervention. The trends are mixed, as I said. None of the existing socio, I mean, economic theories can explain. The, in India, the issue is not the calorie intake. It's not about the hunger. It is about the, the nutrition. It is, it is about the gender, and gender is not about the, the access to the food at the community level, but gender is about the distribution of food within the household. The diversity of a food, it's not the access to the food. And there could be a potential intervention in which we have tried to do it uh, through this, our project we call the acronym we use, the RESMISA project. And in this project, we are trying to enhance the food diversity and the nutrition by promoting small millets. Probably some of you may not have seen those millets ever. And I have a couple of colorful slides uh, to show the millets and their significance and then what we are doing. So these are the six small millets. And uh, I guess uh, probably one millet you may find in the market is here is a finger millet. And if you are from uh, South Asia, then probably you may know the little millet because the little millet is often consumed during fast, uh, um, I mean, um, by Hindus. So the, these are the six millets. They are very less known crop. They are called the minor millets or there are a number of labels have been given over time. And I will take you through the, the stories or the, through the experience they have gone through during this last 40 years period of time. Nutrition wise, nothing can beat these small millets. Look at the rice with the, I mean the red line and look at the nutritional content of the small millets. I wouldn't go too much into a detail, but in every respect, these small millets are, they have a great nutritional value. They have a high calcium, they have a high um, uh, iron. They, are, they have a best fodder value and they are drought resistant, uh, I mean a species they, they, they flourish in the harsh environment, and often now they are called as a climate change ready crop. And these crops were, the, uh, this food were part of a, I mean, the daily diet before 50 years. The, what happened to their area in production, if you look at compared with the, I mean, the Green Revolution crop, the above two lines were about the rice and wheat. The bottom line is about the small millets. And look at the 1950s, the difference between the wheat and small millet was not so significant. And then over the time, through the Green Revolution period, it has touched the rock bottom. The area has declined, and so is the productivity. As I said, there are, I very proudly I said the Green Revolution increased the productivity by three uh, or four times in wheat and rice. 
Look at the small millets, it's quite a flat, uh, uh, I mean, a line. So that they are very marginalized for the last 30 to 40 years. And uh, the area, in fact, declined to a, almost to, a, I mean, a 2% of the cultivated area in some of the areas where I have worked. But through our project, uh, we tried to make an intervention to promote these, these small millets. So we developed a more research project to, to go through the, I mean, these objectives very quickly. Through our research project, we promote the conservation of a biodiversity in these crops. Second objective is to promote the production and area through our participatory research. Third objective is to promote daily consumption, especially where it is grown through a value addition research and, a, and, and solving the post-harvest constraint. And I will give you some idea about what kind of agronomic and post-harvest constraint these, these crops are facing. The fourth is revitalizing the indigenous knowledge. I, as I said, these crops were part of their cultural food and uh, uh, or, or of a daily diet. So the reviving that indigenous knowledge is also very important. And the fifth objective is the, the, the raising the social status of these crops. Actually, these crops became the crops of poor. And the, I mean, I have a number of stories uh, why, uh, about these crops. One of the reasons why these crops were consumed by the poor is that these, these crops were so nutritious. When you make a bread from these millets, actually you do not need a oil. While if you, need, if you want to make a bread from a wheat or a corn or, or some other cereals, you need oil. And oil is one of the most expensive input for a poor. So the poor normally eat the millets. And that's why it became the poor crop of a poor but you, you know the process of modernization and, and the Sanskritization. Poor also wants to eat what we eat, and you won't be surprised if they ask for a pizza as compared to the, I mean, the small millet. So the, the status of these crops have gone down. So we are trying to promote the social status of these crops so we can promote the consumption of these crops. I lived in the, in the tribal area for, I mean, as I was saying, uh, in the year 2002 to 2004, for three months, in the village, I, I was living with a family. Nobody offered me a food with a small millets. I was coming from a higher caste, and they could not understand. They were so shameful to offer those small millets to me. They, they were so, I mean, they could not understand the purpose and the reason for me to stay with them. They saw the foreigner staying with them. I mean, they could understand that the, a foreigner can come and live in the village, but a person from a higher caste in a green revolution, from a green revolution area would live in a tribal area. So they were always offering me rice and wheat while they were eating something different. After the three months, I mean, my relationship, they started off sharing the same food which they were, they were eating. And nothing is, I mean, more delicious and nutritious than these small millets. So the raising the, la the social status of these crops is very important, as important as their productivity and the area. And the last, of course, the policy in order to provide a level playing field, because the, throughout the Green Revolution, the policies are all policies are geared towards those crops. So with those objectives, we started the, the research project in terms of our uh, approach to tell you uh, I mean, a story uh, in a brief. We emphasize on participatory research. So whatever we do, uh, we will work with the farmers, not the, I mean, the engagement of uh, farmers in terms of a physical participation. We work with the Green Revolution institution. Mind, I, mu I must underline that I'm not condemning the institution which played the role in the Green Revolution. We do work with those scientists, but our approach is different. We work with their farmers right from the day one. So farmers are partners in the research, not in the simply partners in the adoption of the technologies. Second, we do the gender analysis at every possible stage in order to understand its impact on the woman at, different, uh, at every level. And the third, the research has to be interdisciplinary. And uh, I'm, I'm very proud to share that the 11 projects which were funded by CEDA and IDRC in the first round, ours was the only project which was led by social scientists and the, NGO, and the development practitioner. We had a, um, I mean, a top brain uh, scientist from the plant, uh, plant sciences, but the leadership was in the hand of a social scientist. So the interdisciplinarity was also very much part, is part of our research. And you will see the kind of a scientific research we have done, done in, the, in the project. It's, it's a cutting edge research, even from the science perspective. Two, <coughs> six different areas we have worked. 
So first to begin with, it is a participatory plant breeding in order to improve the crop varieties. So we are not using the green evolution approach, but we are using the participatory approach where the farmers, uh, we begin with the documentation of the local varieties over the last two years. We have done the experimental trials on 1,300 farmers' fields involving 71 different local varieties and 54 released varieties and 20 pre-released varieties. Again, there is no ideology. I mean, there is, we, we consider both at par. The important thing is to provide access to diversity to farmers at an at a early stage. And also, the, uh, uh, I mean, uh, engage farmers and build a farmer's capacity to work with the crop diversity while the farmers were otherwise, I mean, treated as a recipient of the, I mean, the varieties. So that is a very significant, I mean, a different approach. The second, in terms of agronomic, I mean, most of the work is led by my uh, colleague from University of Guelph, Dr. Manish Raijada. What you see here, the number of experiments we are doing. He's a maverick. I mean, he's, uh, he, he believes that lots of research has been done. And uh, that research can be applied to the small millets, but we are careful that the application is not simple transfer of technology from one crop to the another crop. We do the experiments on, at the farmers, on the farmer's field. What you see here, that the farmers were planting or broadcasting the seeds. Uh, the experiments were done that by simply a line sowing, you can increase the yield by, by I mean, uh, one third. So the, on the right side, it is an it is a, uh, example of a booklet we are trying to make so the farmers can understand in their own language. And the research, whatever you see, it is also an outcome of the research on farmers' field. So the agronomic practices are develop, uh, I mean, being developed in a number of different areas, farm implements, a uh, number of small, small technologies. We call sustainable agriculture kit. And Manish had a dream that we should be able to stitch the kit, which should cost less than $1 and uh, using the different low-cost technologies. And many of those technologies are simply a knowledge rather than buying any input. So trying to improve the, how to improve the farmyard manure, organic manure, number of different ways uh, we, I mean, he is working on. The <clears throat> second, we are not promoting a single crop. We are working at a cropping system level. And the beauty about these crops is that these crops are not I mean, planted as a monocrop. Those are crops are planted with the other crops. So they are all, we work at a cropping system level. And in the three different sites in the state of Tamil Nadu, we did a survey of uh, knowledge of farmers that what kind of uncultivated plants they eat, uh, I mean, uh, in their daily diet. What they reported, they reported 59 different plants they eat as vegetables or, or a curry or some other, other purposes which are part of their, or used to be part of their diet. Out of those 59 plants, 39 plants were from the small millet fields. So if the small millets have gone, then these plants have also gone. gone. And those uncultivated plants were very nutritious. What you see at the bottom, they're just a sample of the nutrient content of those uncultivated plants. Unfortunately, in an industrial and intensive agriculture, these plants are labeled as a weed. And the weed means that you, you spray the chemicals and you remove the, I mean, uh, with the help of weedicide. The next slide shows the scientific research in the lab. The Dr. Steve Newmaster, he is a, I mean, uh, again, his lab is known for barcoding of genes, not for doing the biotechnology or developing, bringing the polar bear gene into the wheat plant, but he is doing, I mean, uh, his work is to, I mean, understand the, uh, the differ difference in the local varieties. So the, you see the barcode, uh, I mean, it is a sample of the barcode of a small millets. The bottom, Manish, I mean, he, in his lab, he is stuck with the root architecture of the small millets. He is looking at why these small millets have such an excellent capacity to thrive in a harsh environment. If we understand the architecture of the root, probably we can develop or help the farmers to develop a new varieties which can grow in a harsh environment. So in the, in the, in the research, in the sciences also, it is pushing beyond the, I mean, the, its age. And all the ideas are working, coming from while working with the farmers. The, the, the barcoding work is also done in order to understand the farmer's classification, that the two different varieties farmers are showing. They look similar, but they are saying they are different. Are they really different? That the, the scientists are trying to understand through the genetic barcoding. The <clears throat> three more slides which I have probably, I mean, uh, I have been shown the sign and uh, they are, 
Yeah, the social scientists, they are very important, and probably I might take two more minutes than my allocated time. Thank you, Joel. The, <laughs> the post-harvest technology, the question we faced at the time of beginning of this project, that if we promote the millet, actually, the millets, promotion of the millet also promotes the drudgery of women. And why? I will explain you in a minute. The millets are very wonderful, I mean, species. So far, I have said they're best in nutrition. They are uh, best in every respect. But they have, they have a curse. And the curse they have is that the grains you see the, the, on, the, on the small slide on the uh, picture in the, on the side, it is probably 100 times magnified view of a grain. And these grains are very tiny grains. And they have a small, tiny layers. In some cases, even five to seven layers. And those, layer, those layers have to be removed uh, physically. While the wheat, rice, and finger millet or pearl millet, those two millets are exceptional. Those cereals are called the naked cereals. As soon as you take the grain out, let's take the corn. I mean, the corn, as soon as the grain, you take it out from the corn, you can eat it, or you can make the flour, and you can consume it. So it, because it is a naked grain. While in case of a small millets, those grains are not naked grains. They are covered with a fine layer. So when you take it out from the panicle, those, those layer, other layers still stay. And the operation which is, I mean, carried out in order to take that layer off, it's called the dehulling, not the threshing. While the other grains are simply, you do the threshing and the grains are separated. And the, there is no technology exists so far, unfortunately, to remove those, those layers from the grain. And that, that operation is very laborious. The only efficient technology available so far, what you see on the left side. The most of the technology, whatever so far available in the market you see, farmers are not satisfied with the nutritional quality. So nothing can match with the hand pounding. And the hand pounding of the grains, uh, it's no, I mean, 100% is job is done by the woman. Very laborious practice. They do it early morning at 5 o'clock in the morning. I mean, probably you might say that it is a good workout, and probably they don't have to go to the gym, but it is a, we are, it is a tough life. So the, we were puzzled with this question that by promoting millets, actually we are promoting the drudgery of women if we do not work with the post-harvest technology. So the, we took up that challenge as a part of our, our research project. The work is still in the progress. We did a couple of uh, different models uh, in our team. We had a, I mean, a top class engineer from the McGill University, and his student did a lot of theoretical modeling that he has been working on this problem for a while, for a while too. So the, what you see here in the picture, obviously, I mean, the Jerry mentioned at the beginning the visit of a governor general of Canada before three weeks to our, our project. And what you see here in the picture is a small, it's a dehuller, dehulling machine, which is developed by the scientists from India in collaboration with a scientist from McGill here. And uh, the, again, we are testing it. We haven't tested at the village level. It is a bigger challenge in my view that whoever finds a, finds a, I mean, a solution to this problem. And let me repeat, they're not the simple solution, not the solution which can work at industrial scale. The solution has to work at a household level or at a community level where there is no energy supply, or assured supply of the energy. And the, also the quality of nutrition not, uh, should not be compromised. Whoever invents this, I mean, a machine, I often tell my students the ideas for a Nobel, um, getting a Nobel Prize or a World Food Prize. I mean, this is a, one of the ideas. If you want to work for the next 10 years and if you come up, uh, I would, I mean, lobby for your World Food Prize, at least, if not the Nobel Prize. I mean, still we are too far from, from finding from the ideal solution. But work is a, well, progressing well. The, we also look at the markets and what you see there, I mean, a complex web. The farmers are producing millets. I mean, their area has declined. What we looked at first time, we, I mean, probably there are no research, I mean, have been done in terms of understanding the market chains of the, uh, of the way the, I mean, the small millets travel to the, to the uh, different chains of the markets and, and go to the consumers. It's a very complex chain. The difference between the farm gate price and the consumer price in some cases is one as to 10. The farmers are selling the grains at the price of 15 to 20 rupees, and in Bangalore, the customer, consumers are paying 200 rupees. 
So the, in the project, we are trying to shorten this, I mean, uh, this uh, chain in order to increase the retain, uh, return for the farmers. Also, what you see here in the middle is a NASIC, which is, again, another story. Uh, it is a black hole. Nobody knew that all the millets were heading to the city, but nobody knew that what happens in NASIC. So we, we did some research. It's an industrial scale processing units, and from there, it goes to export and other domestic markets. So the, our effort is to set up, I mean, I, our dream is to set up a farmer's uh, co-op or a farmer's own company in order to promote add value and, and promote these millets where it is grown. The, uh, the issue of indigenous knowledge, again, I would not come too much, uh, uh, I mean, uh, give too much detail here. We have, I mean, as a social scientist, uh, my colleague, Dr. Saleh Shukla from the, here in the University of Winnipeg and Dr. Derek Johnson, Three of us have a great interest in this issue. We work with the students from the school, try to understand their knowledge, how the knowledge is being eroded, how we can promote the transmission of this knowledge across the generation. And in order to in increase the profile of these millets, because these kids are not interested in small millets. They, want, they, they love to eat the, I mean, the Maggi and, and the other fast food. So a uh, lot of efforts are being made in order to promote the consumption of uh, small millets. I must also underline that the promoting consumption in the city at this point is a very easy task, very easy task. I see a lot of awareness uh, in the cities like Bangalore and, and Mumbai and uh, across the country, and, and so is in, in the developed country too. But the promoting consumption where it is grown, it is a toughest task. We are trying to understand how to unfold that challenge. And a lot of uh, I mean, work we are focusing there. Uh, the, Two more slides I have. The one, again, we are not excluding the urban areas. Most of the NGOs who work on the small millets, their work is slightly different than what we do in our team. And the, the significant difference is that they promote small millets through the niche markets in the, in the cities, through the organic stores and, and uh, the, the consumers who can pay. While we thought that is the city is also very important because lots of people, as I said, they migrate from rural areas to the urban areas, and those are urban poor. And the urban poor do not, I mean, they are facing a serious threat of nutrition compared to even the rural poor. So you have to promote the, the nutritious millets for the urban poor. And uh, two students, uh, again, I'm mean, very proud of my two students from the college. They worked in last year in the summer, and we tried to understand the street food chain in the city and how, how, what kind of, I mean, the food they sell. And to the best of our surprise that the many, I mean the rural migrants who went to the city, actually they saw the opportunity of a, I mean increasing diabetic patient in the city and they were looking for the small millet based food. And they tried to offer through the street food. Again, those stories we can share later on, but it's a fantastic piece of work and it, uh, there's where I have a hope to make the connection between the rural and urban poor, not between the rural and urban elites. And in order to address the, address the nutritional security for urban poor and, urban, and uh, uh, for India, I mean the urban poor is very important. And this chain promises a lot. And uh, again, I mean, I, I worked a lot, so I have a lot to say. I mean, I would say that even as in academics, this chain had never received any attention because the Marxists consider, I mean, it's a kind of a, uh, this chain, uh, uh, anyway, okay, maybe I'll talk about it later on, yeah. It's a fascinating topic. I mean, why it has been even ignored by the scholars, not simply by the development practitioner. And the last, promoting the small millets through the public chain. Uh, through our project, we work with the government schemes. What you see in a picture, it is a kind of a rusty picture, but I mean, that's how the public sector works. The integrated child development scheme launched by the government in 1970s and not much effective for a long time. And basically, it promotes rice and, uh, rice and wheat, which were promoted through the Green Revolution and the other, other policies. Through the project, what we tried to do, we tried to intervene, uh, introduce the sing, uh, I mean, uh, these uh, small millets, and it wasn't an easy task. The cost of small millet is so high, the processing is involved, and the, small, uh, the public sector doesn't have money, and the question of innovation doesn't exist there. So the, after introducing the millets, we, from the project, we are paying the nine as to one cost. The government pays the one percent, while the, I mean, the nine part we pay. The, with the new menu, which we have tried to introduce, uh, I mean, it enhances the nutritional quality. What we believe that the first 1,000 days 
of a child is very important from the conception for the health. So this scheme focuses about, I mean, the pregnant woman and the children up to the age of the six years. And if we address the nutrition of the children in this, uh, this particular period, then it is much cheaper and the return is also much higher. So through the public chain also we try to work in order to promote the small millets. The last slide, what the government is doing, again, I mean, the, one of the most debated topic of last 10 years, and India has been celebrated, I mean, has been considered as the best example by introducing the new act called the Right to Food Act or a National Food Security Act. And it promises, uh, I mean, the five kilo of a cereals at a subsidized price uh, to the 75% of the rural population and 50% of the urban population. And in this scheme, they have promised, or at least there is a provision of including the coarse grain. Now again, for the government, coarse grain is a very political term. They have not defined the term. Coarse grain can be, can be corn, can be sorghum, can be pearl millet, not necessarily, uh, not necessarily those small millets. But anyway, it's a good change, but a lot, I mean, the, in my view, the legis uh, this act is a one step forward, two step backward, and we would have a little bit more analysis later, later on. It does not address any of those issues, issue of a distribution at the household level, level issue of increasing the diversity, or issue of a enhancing the nutrition or access to the nutritional food. So far, it is a kind of a more of the same what they have done over 40 years. And the cost of this new act, if it is implemented, I mean, in a right spirit, the economists are divided. There is a huge debate between the two school of thoughts. One is called the Amartya Sen school, and another is called the Bhagavati school. And the one school estimates their cost is somewhere around 1%, 1.1%. The other school estimates 3% of the cost. Again, it's a, it's a very, I mean, a sensitive and a very hugely debated point, I mean, the issue. Unfortunately, most of the time, the debate was only in the English news media or the editorial pages, while the, I mean, most of the people in the parliament did not discuss this. Uh, so the, the recapping, I mean, whatever I've said, the, the features of the food security in India is totally different than the global food security issues. It is an issue, it is a disconnect between the soil health, animal health, food health, and the human health. That's what my grandfather says, that if you do not have a good health, a good soil, your animals are not good healthy, or the, if you do not have good healthy animals, your soil won't be healthy either. And the human health you can't expect if you don't have a good health of a soil. The lack of food diversity in the food basket, the nutrition content, so a number of those features which anyway I have highlighted so far. India needs a decentralized smart policy solutions not in the form of a mega projects or mega, I mean the, I mean the X and, and the schemes with a 3% of the, G, I mean the budget of a 3% of the GDP. Again, we would talk a little bit I mean, in more detail later on. And lastly, I would say that the, all the development actors have to change their current practices and programs, including the food activists. I mean, they are missing this uh, deeper analysis at a local level. And again, we would continue this analysis later on. Thank you so much. I guess I took 10 minutes more than probably what I was supposed to. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.